Hi everyone, um, I'm Anne Rose and I'm associate in the commercial team at Mishkondorea. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about sponsorship agreements and some of the key legal and commercial issues you might want to be aware of. So before I kick off with that, I was actually going to have a little bit of a discussion about who the sponsors are and why you may even want to think about sponsorship in the first place. So sponsors are usually businesses with either recognizable or new to market brand names that they wish to promote. And there are different reasons why businesses may choose to invest in sports sponsorship to achieve that goal. And the most common are being building awareness. So a lot of sporting events get huge coverage. Think about like the Premier League where it's broadcast in over 200 different countries. You might want to attract new customers. So a sponsor can really benefit from associating its brand with a particular sport or club and the attributes associated with it. You might want to breathe new life into a failing brand and suddenly if you are associated with a particular club, you might be thought of as cool again. Um, or even thinking about like corporate social responsibility. So actually businesses who are seen to support sport, particularly where the sponsorship is linked to grassroots or community projects, they can really benefit from sponsorship agreements. So we talked about who the sponsors are, but what about the rights holders? So these are often event organizers. So it could be a one-off event, think about the Olympics, or more regular competitions like the Football Premier League. It could be a governing body, which controls the national team of their sport and actually organizes competitions and events within that sport. It could be a club, it could be an individual team, or an individual athlete, or even broadcasters who have rights to broadcast sporting events. So some of the key legal and commercial issues to think about are first, the sponsor's rights. So the ideal position for a sponsor is to be the only sponsor of an event. So a rights holder is like to reject such a position as it will be able to receive more sponsorship revenue from granting rights to a suite of sponsors. So most common therefore, it's for a rights holder to grant a sponsor product category exclusivity. So the rights holder will undertake not to enter into sponsorship relationships with any of the sponsor's competitors during the term of the sponsorship agreement. So what does this look like in practice? So if you think about how competitor might be defined, it's normally in relation to a defined market. So it could be the car rental market or the market for alcoholic beverages or the betting and gaming industry. And with sponsors wanting the market to find widely, rights holders want it very narrow. And in addition, sponsors may require the rights holder not to enter into more than a certain number of sponsorships to avoid diluting the impact of the sponsorship. We just talked about one way of limiting the exclusivity. And another way of doing it is actually by territory. So Manchester United does this really well. So for instance, it has appointed STC in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Medianet in the Maldives, PCCW in Hong Kong, and so forth. And clubs can also actually use modern technology to assist with this strategy. So by actually using digital overlays of pitch side LED boards, it means that those boards can be edited and broadcasting to display different brands for different territorial broadcasts, which is incredibly helpful. So another thing to think about is ambush marketing. So ambush marketing is when third parties not contracted to the rights holder, attempt to create public associations with the rights holder through deliberate marketing activity. And successful ambush marketing creates uncertainty in the mind of the public as to who the actual sponsor is, which is associated with the rights holder. And therefore that can reduce the value of your sponsorship. So if you think back to 2014, where Coca-Cola were the official sponsor of the Brazil World Cup, its rival Pepsi, which wasn't a sponsor of the tournament at all, it launched a push featuring stars such as Barcelona's Leo Messi, Arsenal's Jack Wilshere, and it was all set in Rio, and everyone was very confused as to who the official sponsor was. So other than for major international events, where you might have actual event-specific legislation preventing such conduct and activity, like in the Olympic Games, a rights holder kind of needs to offer a sponsor assurances that has a program in place to prevent ambush marketing. It could be through a combination of registering and enforcing its intellectual property rights. It could be through imposing ticketing conditions which restrict photography and filming and conducting sponsor awareness campaigns. So 
now we're going to talk about one of the key things of a sponsorship agreement, and that is fees. And there are so many different types of structures that you can get into when looking at sponsorship fees. So the sponsorship fee may simply be a monetary sum, which could be agreed by the parties, and the rights holder will often want a fee upfront at the start of the term. Or, in a case of longer term sponsorship, it might be an annual fee at the start of each contract year. Alternative structures for the consideration that can be used are payments in kind, um, and that's quite common in official supplier relationships. Um, and then you can also have performance related elements. So a sponsor may pay a bonus to a rights holder if they achieve certain sporting milestones. And on the flip side, you want to think about if you can actually reduce the amount of sponsorship fees you have to pay if, let's say, the football team doesn't qualify or it's relegated or if an individual doesn't compete in a certain number of events or let's say they're injured and you're not getting as much coverage as you'd expect and therefore the value of your sponsorship is diminished. And in some instances, a rights holder may actually want a form of parent or, or bank guarantee as well. So whilst a relationship may seem great at the time, at the very beginning, you need to think about what's going to happen at the end. So the expiry and termination of any sponsorship agreement. So sponsorship agreement will simply expire at the end of the term if it's just a one-off event. However, if you're looking at a longer term relationship, a sponsor may want an opportunity to renew the arrangement at the end. And so often they will want to negotiate for a right to renew and a first right of refusal because they won't want a competitor to kind of come in the way and steal the value and all this goodwill that they've built up in their brand. And on the flip side, a, a rights holder will often want to include what's called a matching rights clause, which may permit a rights holder to negotiate with third parties towards the end of the term, then to offer the existing sponsor the right to renew the sponsorship arrangement on equivalent terms. Now, rights holders can often see these matching rights clauses as diminishing the value that they may be able to achieve in the market, as potential sponsors may be unwilling to undertake a lengthy negotiation process if a competitor can then trump them after terms have been agreed. So many of you may have heard about the New Balance and Liverpool case. And some of the things that came out of that is actually thinking about the importance of ensuring the scope of any matching rights carefully considered, carefully drafted, that the value in undertaking appropriate due diligence before making any sponsorship offer, you know, have you actually looked at their overseas activities and the growing strategic importance of global superstar athletes and non-athletes to apparel companies. So if you're looking at a compromise position between this, sometimes what they might do is actually agree an exclusive negotiation period prior to expiry, after which, if agreement hasn't been reached, a rights holder is free to enter into arrangements with third parties. Another key factor to think about is IP. And this is crucial for sponsorship agreements, and it's incredibly valuable for both parties. So you need to think about who owns the rights and the goodwill if you're going to create a joint logo. So if one party is going to own that logo, you need to think about how the other one's going to get value, especially for usage after the term. You also need to think about what personality or image rights be used. My colleague Tom is going to talk about image rights a little bit further. In, you must also need to consider like the differences in legal protection for personality rights in different jurisdictions and whether you have assignments from designers of any rights in logos, or marks and so on and whether that's been obtained, you actually have the right to use any of the designs you've created. And key to many sponsorship agreements is the right of a sponsor to use a rights holder's crest their name and any other identifying features. And these rights can be granted most effectively if they're registered as trademarks by the rights holder. And a rights holder is unlikely to have registered as trademark in every class and in every jurisdiction because it's incredibly expensive. So sponsor will need to focus on having key, three key things. So it'll want a warranty from a rights holder in relation to registration in key classes and in key jurisdictions it want, in which you want to exercise its sponsorship rights. It also wants an undertaking from the sponsor to actually renew those registrations at the relevant times and pay for the cost of doing so. And it also wants an indemnity from the sponsor for any third party claims in relation to use of those marks and how that risk is allocated will usually depend on the bargaining power of the parties. 
I'm going to end on another like three key things to think about. So these are morality clauses, regulatory challenges, and I don't think any talk at the moment can be done without speaking about COVID or force majeure clauses. So morality, I mentioned morality. What is a morality clause? So a primary purpose of sponsorship for the sponsor is to be associated with rights holders' positive image. And a sponsor therefore will need assurances that through the use of a so-called morality clause, that a rights holder will not, during the term of a sponsorship agreement, act in a way that tarnishes the public's view of its brand. And this is particularly acute for endorsement deals, so personal endorsement deals, when you have a rights holder who is um, an individual athlete, for example. So if you think back to um, Nike's sponsorship of, say, Tiger Woods and Oscar Pistorius, um, stories from their private lives became public sensations overnight. So you really need to think about whether you have a termination right if anything like this happens, and also whether you want to have the ability just to put things on ice and just see how things go. Um, you may even, if they were caught, for instance, taking drugs, want to put in a clause which requires them to have to go to rehab. Another thing to think about is, is regulatory challenges. So if you are sponsoring a big event like the F1 or, or World Cup, you know, can the sponsor exercise its rights in all those territories? So if you, let's say you're acting in the, the betting gaming industry, there can be a problem sometimes in having your logo on the kit in certain territories. And this is a really big thing to think about at the beginning and doing your due diligence in respect of each individual territory and thinking about what the next steps are if you're not able to exercise your rights in a particular jurisdiction. And the last thing to talk about is COVID or force majeure clauses. And brands can still get the benefit of association in the run-up to an event, even if it's cancelled. Now, if you are a rights holder, you may still want to think about having insurance in place for certain pandemics. So if you think about Wimbledon, it took out pandemic insurance back in 2003 as a result of SARS. And it's reported that they've been paying around 1.5 million a year in order to have this insurance in place. And this has massively benefited them this year. And they are reported to be getting a 174 million pound payout as a result of the coronavirus. I hope you've enjoyed this talk on sponsorship and some of the key legal and commercial issues to think about. If you have any queries, please do get in touch with us. Thank you.